today on Missing Link. What joins a carousel without a space? What does our universe have to do with a sponge? What brings sponges and dolphins together? And what connects marine mammals with power stations? There aren't any links? Oh yes there are, you just have to look really hard. Missing Link. Even in hard times, people flock to amusement parks. Maybe even more so than usual. There are about 60 of them in Germany and about 20 in France. In Germany alone, over 20 million people visit amusement parks every year. Sasha Zabo frequents amusement parks regularly, doing so in the name of science. The sociologist researches the underlying reasons why people are drawn to amusement parks. The main attractions of amusement parks are the huge chairaplanes, roller coasters and high water slides. These rides are all about experiencing a lot of orientation and pure speed. Do people go on these rides to escape the routine of daily life? Or is there another more profound reason? Psychologists believe that we live in constant awareness of our own mortality. And although we suppress this knowledge, the fear is always there, deep in our subconscious. Wenn wir jetzt danach fragen, was daran faszinierend ist, dann können wir sagen, dass der Mensch in diesem kurzen Moment das Wissen um seine Sterblichkeit vergisst. Also Achterbahnen und Wasserbahnen sind sozusagen ein kurzer Blick in einem Paradies, in einem Jenseits des Wissens um die eigene Sterblichkeit, weswegen ja auch die Vergnügungsparks Freizeitparadiese genannt werden. If this is true, roller coasters are a really good way of driving out morbid thoughts, which explains why people don't mind queuing up for a ride, often for up to an hour. Scientists have identified two types of roller coaster riders: those who throw their arms in the air and enjoy the rush of fear, and those who cling tightly to the rails and scream in terror. The scared effect. Sasha Zabo believes that the kick gradually wears off, that the thrill of fear fades over time. This explains why roller coaster fans are in constant search of higher, faster roller coasters. Not everyone seeks escape at amusement parks. Nevertheless, the desire to drive out morbid fears is something we all share. For example, some people get a thrill out of bungee jumping or driving a fast car. In fact, all sorts of amusement park rides satisfy certain needs people can't fulfill in their everyday lives. Die Faszination dieser Hochfahrgeschäfte ist, eigentlich handelt es sich um Aufzugstechnik und sie erhebt uns von dem Erdboden. Und das Bemerkenswerte ist, wenn wir jetzt hier runterblicken, erweitert sich unser Horizont. A bird's eye view of life is something people have always found thrilling. It was in the Middle Ages that people first developed a sensibility for the aerial perspective, the horizon and gazing into the distance. The view from above was always considered the domain of kings, of gods. The privilege of seeing the world from above, of having an overview of the world below, was reserved exclusively for the gods on Mount Olympus. Amusement parks are places where our minds and bodies perceive life in an elevated state, both literally and figuratively. Roller coasters, water slides and flying swings provide visceral sensations, whereas shows and performances appeal to our psyche. It's this constant desire for new experiences that drives us our whole life long. A high-tech observatory in a remote region of Argentina. Scientists working here are trying to solve the last mysteries of the cosmos. But what do chairaplanes have to do with outer space? Outer space is appropriately known for its endless expanse. Truth is that in this empty space there's a bunch of stuff whizzing about. The Earth for one and the Sun for another. Even a galaxy or two. 
What all this material has in common is that it is turning, rotating. The Earth turns around the Sun and our solar system turns around our galaxy. Well, we all know from funfairs what happens if we start going round. On a roundabout, we don't fly around in a circle, but tend to be thrown outwards. We use our arms to hold on. That's the centrifugal force. Taking a look at the cosmic carousel, we can't see any arms holding the Earth onto the Sun, and yet the Earth remains on track. The reason is gravity, the force of attraction between two masses. This firmly links the Earth and the Sun invisibly together, and it should work in the same way for galaxies. But there's a problem. The total amount of material present is insufficient to account for forces needed to hold it all together. But there simply must be, otherwise the galaxies would all just fly apart. And that leads us to believe that there's a big chunk of the universe we're simply not seeing. This unknown, invisible and secretive material mass is called dark matter. And it's the matter from which the arms that hold the universe together is forged. It's a 15-hour flight from Europe to Mendoza, a town in western Argentina. Johannes Blumer, an astroparticle physicist from Karlsruhe, Germany, often travels here with his students. Just a few hours south of Mendoza is the world's largest observatory for research into cosmic rays. Together with scientists from 15 different countries, Blumer has established this scientific centre in rural Argentina over the course of many years. Far from civilization and the light pollution created by big cities, they can carry out their research undisturbed. Johannes Blumer is on his way to the northern detector station of the Pierre Auger Observatory. At the heart of the observatory are 24 special telescopes with an undisrupted view of the sky, shielded from civilization with black interiors. With the aid of these telescopes, scientists working here can observe the entire southern night sky. The data is always collected around the time of the new moon. Work begins just after dusk, when the moon isn't too bright. Cosmic particles collide with air molecules, which burst apart, causing a sudden release of secondary particles. The light sensors in the detector tanks register the collisions. The telescopes can see the particles too, up to 20 miles up in the sky. Every telescope uses large concave mirrors which are directed towards the sky. The mirrors redirect the ultraviolet light of the light showers into the cameras, which consist of an array of light sensors in the center of the telescope. The recorded data is then sent, along with the data from the detection tanks, to the control center. Using this technology, it's possible to record up to 30 impacts of high-energy particles per year. The Auger Observatory has opened up a new window on the cosmos, with surprising results. We've been observing the cosmos, keeping track of the coordinates and the effective measuring time. And we've discovered that there is an excess of particles coming from the direction of Centaurus A. Centaurus A is a galaxy located 14 million light years from Earth. It's characterized by the band of dust that passes through it. Researchers at the Pierre Auger Observatory were the first to discover that the active galactic nucleus of Centaurus A is a source of high-energy cosmic rays. 
im Zentrum vermutet man ein super, super massives schwarzes Loch. Und die Materie stürzt Material in dieses äh, schwarze Loch hinein und an den Achsen werden sehr massive Plasmaströme hinausgeschleudert. Und als Folge dieser kosmischen Rays People on Earth are in constant contact with material from the heart of distant galaxies. As technology progresses, we are able to gaze even further into the universe. We can see millions of stars, stellar clusters, galaxies, nebulae and stellar debris, all of which are sending cosmic particles towards us. Researchers now have the technical means to solve the mystery of cosmic rays, which will in turn lead to a new understanding of the universe. Ice diving in Siberia. The unique underwater world of Lake Baikal is home to countless freshwater sponges. But what's the connection between these sponges and outer space? Sponges aren't just the things we use for cleaning, they're animals. At least the natural sponges are. Before they can assume their position in the bathroom, though, they need to take part in a rather grisly performance. Sponges are plucked from the ocean floor and soaked in a whole range of chemicals to ensure they're free of any creepy crawlies. What's left is the sponge's skeleton, which in comparison to our skeleton is very soft. After this, the sponge is predestined for beauty and body care. As well as helping answer some of the biggest questions in the world, such as, is outer space infinitely big? The sponge has the answer, because when it's squeezed together and then left, it expands. Just like our universe, it expands equally in all directions. We know that because we can measure whether galaxies are either approaching or moving away from us. And what we actually observe is that all galaxies are moving apart everywhere we look. And that leads us to the conclusion that space is moving ever outwards. And therefore, it's not infinitely large, because it keeps on getting bigger. So enough Captain Kirk with space, the final frontier. It just keeps getting bigger. The ice is one meter thirty thick. It's hard work for both man and machine. It takes hours to drill a hole that's big enough for a diver to enter the water. Lake Baikal in southern Siberia. An expedition under the ice in search of creatures that have existed on Earth for millions of years. Sponges. Werner Müller, a biologist from Mainz, Germany, is getting ready for his dive. He's about to go in search of the rare creatures. We hope to see some sponges. I'm certain we'll find some here, but I'm not sure if we'll be able to see them, because it's quite dark down there due to the snow. We do know that sponges can be found here at a depth of around 5 to 7 meters, so I'm confident we'll find A professional Russian diver will accompany Müller, because ice diving is very dangerous, and even one small mistake could prove fatal. But this is no extreme sport. Werner Müller is hoping to make new discoveries. Biologists are very keen to find out how sponges are able to thrive in such cold waters. It will certainly help us to understand why sponges have managed to be such a successful species in the history of the Earth and how they managed to survive the winters in the cold climatic periods. They plunge into the depths of a unique underwater world. Lake Baikal is more than 1,600 meters deep and around 25 million years old. It's a true El Dorado for biologists, because many of the plants and animals found here can be found nowhere else on Earth. At first, the lake doesn't seem to be showing many of its natural riches, and there's no sign of any sponges. The divers have to search deeper, moving yet further away from the small hole in the ice that connects them to the outside world and then their efforts are rewarded. Werner Müller has been researching sponges for over 30 years, and he's turned these apparently boring creatures into true superstars. The scientist considers the Lake Baikal sponges to be among the most advanced of their species, and their abilities are unique. 
So it's no wonder that the researcher himself has set out in search of the creatures in this hostile underwater habitat. It was like being in a forest that I could swim through. There was one sponge after the next. It was really fascinating. It was quite gloomy and sometimes a bit spooky too because it was so deep. We dived to about 15 meters and at that depth it's quite dark because of the weather and the snow on the ice. Werner Müller and his colleagues are convinced that in the course of evolution, all other animals develop from sponges. Which means that the sponge is probably our oldest living relative. Müller is certain that we can learn a great deal from sponges too, and that they may even help revolutionize medical technology. It's only been a few years since scientists first discovered just how sponges produce their skeletons. Sponges can do something that no other living being can do. They're able to produce glass, just like window glass, in an enzymatic process. This time-lapse film shows us how tiny needles grow layer upon layer to form so-called bioglass, a material which can be implanted in the human body. The bioglass attracts the cells that are able to differentiate into bone cells. And when the cells are docked and have been induced to differentiate, they're able to produce bone material. In future, we'll probably see prosthetic limbs coated with bioglass or implants made entirely of bioglass. The fine glass fibers found in sponges are also outstanding optical fibers and much more flexible than conventional cables. Oddly enough, sponges are able to produce glass in the ice-cold waters of Lake Baikal, a seemingly dull creature and a living glass factory. These marine mammals are very close to our hearts, but all too often they are robbed of their natural freedom and kept in dolphinariums. And anyway, what do sponges have to do with dolphins. Dolphins are lovely creatures, apart from which they qualify as intelligent and are friendly to humans. They're a recurring story throughout history that tell of them rescuing people from drowning that have been shipwrecked. But their story is not all just about altruism. Get under their skin and there's no forgiveness. In hunting close to the seabed, the dolphins use their snout to beat against the ocean floor. If it's a sandy floor, then no problem. But if there are sharp rocks in the sand, then it's no laughing matter for them. And to protect themselves from injury, dolphins have developed a clever strategy. They sink their teeth into the sponge and hold on until they've got it. Now, the soft sponge becomes their snout protection. The sponge probably isn't too keen on the practice, but there again, it's not as smart as a dolphin. Oh well, that's life. This underwater world is teeming with visitors. And it's not just during the holidays that people flock to visit sea life in Berlin. But no matter how hard they press their noses against the glass, there are some sea creatures they just won't find here. You won't find any dolphins here at sea life, nor any larger species of shark or whales. We feel these animals can't be kept in captivity in a humane way. Adhering to a code of company ethics, Sea Life operates fully in accordance with the Whale and Dolphin Conservation Society. Nicholas Entrup, the managing director of WDCS Germany, has been fighting against dolphinariums for many years. We have to look at the needs of the animals. These are migrating animals with a highly developed social system. They form very dynamic groups and have specific needs in terms of habitat. All of these things can't be simulated in an artificial environment. Dolphins can cover up to 60 miles per day and dive down several hundred feet. According to animal welfare groups, the monotony of life in a tank, dead food and lack of sheltered areas are inhumane and cause the creatures stress. Duisburg Dolphin Area. Six dolphins currently live here. During the performances, the keepers try to provide the spectators with greater knowledge of these marine animals. Management emphasizes that they keep the dolphins for educational and not for commercial purposes. 
ein Delfinarium, wenn es äh, den gesetzlichen as as Vorgaben entspricht, mit vernünftiger Pflege, guidelines and der Tierpfleger und alle betreuenden Mitarbeiter, ist staff, sicherlich, äh, sicherlich als eine really Einrichtung zu sehen, wo nichts äh, Gegenteiliges äh, an Argumenten vorzubringen wäre. The dolphins at Duisburg Zoo are registered in a stud book, as are the dolphins at Germany's two other dolphinariums in Nuremberg and Münster. EU laws prohibit the capture of wild dolphins, so the zoos have to rely on their own stocks to breed it. Whether this is feasible in the long term is a matter of heated debate between animal welfare groups and the dolphinariums. A dolphin show in Valencia. Spain is a member of the EU, meaning the capture of wild dolphins is technically illegal here. However, the Spanish WWF has reported that dolphins here were caught off the coast of Cuba. This is possible due to a rather lax interpretation of an exemption regulation. The EU has set down, has set down a very clear species, species protection law, which strictly prohibits the import of dolphins for commercial purposes. Yet again and again, dolphin areas manage to find loopholes to bring dolphins, mainly through Spain, into EU territory, where internal trade laws apply. And this issue, already a problem in the EU, is totally out of control on a worldwide level. In Turkey, there are currently several proposed sites for new dolphin shows, most of them in busy tourist areas. The dolphins come from the Black Sea, and some allegedly come from Japan. Animal welfare groups complain of poor hygiene conditions and animal cruelty. Some tour operators have removed trips to the Turkish Dolphinarium in Belek from their programs. Animal welfare groups are calling for a boycott of all dolphinariums, including those in Germany. Man kann nicht pauschalisieren. Man muss sich schon die Mühe machen, dann herauszufiltern und die Unterschiede zu deklarieren. Die sind nun mal klipp und klar gegeben in sehr gravierender Form gegeben, was gerade zoologische Gärten solche und solche und Delfinarien solche und solche gibt. Good and bad. Good and bad. Without wanting to bring the scientific aspirations and good care of many dolphinariums into question, it's not easy for spectators to distinguish between a good dolphinarium and a bad one. And yet, many of us still want to see these creatures up close. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a catch-22 situation. The demolition of a decommissioned nuclear power station, a dangerous undertaking. The radioactive debris from the nuclear reactor must be disposed of under very strict safety regulations. But what's the link between dolphins and power stations? The job of a power station is to generate electricity, no matter whether it's from coal, oil or nuclear. Unfortunately though, this transformation of one form of energy into another does not happen without loss. And the key word here is efficiency which means a power station that can only convert 40% of its input into electricity is losing 60% as warmth, most of which can't be used. So where can this waste warmth go? Most power stations are situated by big rivers whose water is used for cooling. Then there are the massive cooling towers to keep the power stations from overheating. But the dolphin also has an efficiency factor. It too is unable to use the entire energy intake it gets from nature for propulsion. It generates warmth that it needs to lose, and it does that through its tail fin. If a dolphin needs to lose a lot of warmth, it increases the blood flow to its fins, transferring the excess warmth to the water and avoiding overheating. When swimming in colder waters without exertion, then smaller quantities of blood flow through the fins. A perfect self-regulating system of nature that took the builders of power stations decades to develop. An average morning at the decommissioned nuclear power station in Burgassen, Germany. The workers have to change out of their clothes so that they don't come into contact with radioactive particles. Day after day, Thomas van Appeldoorn and his colleagues work in the contaminated building. Their task, to disassemble the power plant and prepare it for disposal. Von Appeldoorn always carries a dosimeter with him. The device measures the radiation he's exposed to over the course of the day. At worst, an overdose of radioactivity could prove deadly in the long term. During the whole time that people are working here in the control area, we measure the dosage and we can take readings immediately. And we can take readings immediately. And we can take readings immediately. Burgassen nuclear power station is over 40 years old. 
Due to a crack found in the reactor vessel, the plant was shut down in 1994 and decommissioned three years later. Since then, experts have been making efforts to dispose of the reactor's deadly legacy. Barrels containing waste were dumped in the reactor pool as a temporary measure. This waste is so radioactive that it must never be allowed to leak into the environment. The water is supposed to protect the workers from the most intense radiation. Surprisingly, over 95% of the power station's parts might be able to be recycled one day after they've been cleansed of radioactive particles. Engineer Frank Bollas is coordinating the dismantling of the Burgassen power plant. With the help of Thomas van Appeldoorn, he has to measure the contamination in every area of the plant and decide if it's possible to work there at all. The Geiger counter starts to click. Working here will be hazardous. The large reactor vessel will have to be dismantled. A few hours later, the dismantled parts have to be sawn into smaller parts. This risky work has to be carried out in a sealed container. Then they start the most dangerous work in the reactor, following the strictest safety procedures. To protect himself from deadly radioactive particles, Foreman Volker Tillman puts on two pairs of overalls. His job is to decontaminate an irradiated metal plate. The double layer of clothing isn't enough. He puts on a third airtight body seal. Every joint and seam must be completely sealed. A visor made of special safety plastic protects his eyes. Finally, there is a fourth layer. It's made of Kevlar, the same material used for bulletproof vests. Tillman is now completely sealed off from the outside world. He blasts the metal plate with very fine steel shot. It takes many minutes of strenuous work to remove the radioactive particles from the surface of the metal. The gradual disassembly of the nuclear reactor has cost 700 million euros so far. That's more than it cost to build. Today, Van Appeldoorn and Bollas have to tackle a very special assignment. The fuel rods have long since been disposed of, but the irradiated pump has to be removed and there are still fragments of fuel at the bottom of the reactor pool. It's easy to shield the workers from the radiation, but inhaling just one speck of radioactive dust could endanger their health. For safety reasons, they decide to saw through the irradiated pump under water. The men on the platform bring their machines into position. The jigsaw is operated via remote control. The saw gradually comes to a halt. The blade is blunt. The men now have to replace the contaminated saw block. During the operation, Thomas van Appeldoorn has to ensure that the workers are not exposed to doses above the legal limit. The men are not directly in direct contact with the saw. They operate it from a crane. The rules is anything we take out of the saw must not exceed a dose of 2 millisieverts per hour. Van Appeldoorn measures the radiation with a so-called teledetector, so that he can remain at a safe distance. The radiation protection expert checks the saw with meticulous care. He only gives the OK when he's satisfied everything is in order. The saw can now be lifted out. The team have been dismantling the reactor for about 15 years now and it will take another five years at the very least. <laughs>